thanks to a global coalition of scientists and their high-tech telescopes. Stay with us. For decades, the notion of black holes in the universe only existed in Albert Einstein's theory and in the popular imagination. No longer. On Wednesday, humanity got its very first look at a black hole, a monstrous ring-like mass of dense matter, light and gas, roughly 6.5 billion times the size of the sun and millions of trillions of miles away. All this imagery was delivered to the human eye thanks to a remarkable advance in both scientific technology and international cooperation, the Event Horizon Telescope Project, which had placed eight radio telescopes around the world. How difficult was it to finish this uh, Herculean task, as the Event Horizon team described it? What does this discovery mean for the further study of black holes and of the universe itself? And what's the potential for greater international teamwork and science without borders? Joining the discussion here in the studio are Zhang Fan, Associate Professor of Astronomy at the Beijing Normal University, and uh, Haldor Berg, Country Representatives of uh, Euraxis China, an organization boosting EU-China and international collaboration in science and technology. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Show. Thank you. Now, this is a very alien topic for me, let's say. It's not politics, it's about science, but I'll try. There's <laughs> more politics than you imagine. <laughs> There's more politics? Uh oh, can't get away from it. Well, first, let's take a little bit of time to look at the definition of black holes. And according to National Science Foundation, Black holes are extremely dense pockets of matter, objects of such incredible mass and minuscule volume that they drastically warp the fabric of space-time. Anything that passes too close from a wandering star to a photon of light gets captured. Most black holes are the condensed remnants of a massive star, the collapsed core that remains following an explosive supernova. Professor Zhang, how did you like my description? Did it make sense? Yes, that's, uh, <laughs> that's official transcript, so that's I'll, say, I'll say that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you. I, I, you know, it's difficult to read it without understanding it, but why are people so fascinated about black holes? This is actually one of the areas that scientists, science outreach actually reached people. So kudos to uh, John Wheeler, who came up with the name black holes. Uh, it really captured people's imagination where no light can even escape. And then I think the fascination about celestial bodies that really carried over all the way from ancient Greek times, you know, Aristotle and all the ether mm. celestial bodies. Okay. And, yeah. okay, but what does it mean to me now that we've seen a black hole? Um, how do well, does I it make a difference for me? I think it makes all the difference in the world. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm not a scientist either, actually, but I do work with the uh, European Research Council who are one of the main funding bodies of, this, uh, of the Event Horizon Telescope. And we are very excited. And I think everybody in the world is actually excited. Mm. It's very nice to see how, uh, how this is sort of bringing people together all over the world in, in the, the joint human uh, curiosity. And uh, it, is very, it is something that you should care about. Uh, I think why people are fascinated by black holes is because it's, there's something mysterious about them. Right, mm, a little bit terrifying, maybe, and not only for like us people. I think also scientists, because it really breaks sort of at at the event horizon. At horizon beyond that, we don't know what's there. Mm, so now we're trying to look. Yeah, <laughs> is that true for you? Uh, yes, being a scientist, uh, being not being able to see beyond event horizon has very good, a lot of advantages. You can imagine all sorts of things come up with all sorts of theories. That's very difficult to test, but um, this Event Horizon Telescope would actually allow us to test some of the uh, theories, such as um, Einstein's general relativity in this mm. instance. Well, I understand there are different black holes as well. There are the primordial black holes, the intermediate mass black holes, stellar mass black holes, and supermassive black holes. Which one did we see this time? This, what kind? This is the supermassive one. This is a really, one. really big one as well. Okay. It's uh, billions of light. Uh, the mass is billions of that of our own sun. Um, so that's, uh, that's quite something. Mm. And um, there is also this, um, this whole thing about the relationship at a, about a singularity and uh, uh, whatever it's around it. Um, tell us a little bit. If the black hole is so invisible, if no light comes out of it, how come we're seeing it? 
Right, so we're not seeing the, the black hole itself. Uh, the question you asked is really good. So the singularity is not a black hole. Black hole is the region where, uh, surrounding the singularity where light couldn't get out of. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the edge of that area is called event horizon. That's the name, event horizon telescope. What we're seeing is not light from the black hole itself, but from matter before they fall into the black hole. Uh, so light can still get out. Uh, but black hole is kind of a shadow silhouette in that, in, that, in that background, which is why you see a ring. And black hole is actually somewhere in the middle of that, that middle black uh, shadow part. Okay, yeah. okay. Basically, we didn't see the black hole. We just saw, because of the lights that were surrounding it, we saw the, the, That's right. the, the thing that we think is the black hole. But in, some people are saying, you know, it's not very clear. It's... Uh, not very exciting. It looks like a red donut or some other funny things. Um, what's so groundbreaking about this picture, Hado? I mean, like, uh, in some ways, you could also say it's the clearest picture in history. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We've never been able to sort of see a small thing as far away, ever. And people thought this was impossible. And uh, I mean, like, just very recently, people were saying this was impossible. And I would have said that. I would have said that's ridiculous. And yeah. they had to create a telescope the size of the planet. And when you have, a, when you have a, a problem like that, you need a solution that is the size of the planet. And actually, you had to join uh, uh, cooperation from like all different continents. There were there were, were very significant contributions from from the European Union and and America, but there was also here in China, for example, a lot of different uh, researchers involved. Right, right. Um, I understand there are altogether eight different radio telescopes stationed right. in different parts of the world, basically, as you say, forming a Earth-sized telescope. But it took them like two years, right, to, to put together the data so that they can have this image. Why, is it, why does it have to be such a global effort and why does it take so long? Did you, do you understand? Uh, I, I do, but I'm trying to to make sure that uh, our audience understand. Yeah, um, okay, let's right. give it a try. <laughs> so, so as uh, Hodor just uh, said, the um, black hole is a tiny little patch on the sky, and we want to see the shadow in that thing. So we really need to resolve a very, very small thing in the sky, which is why we need this very long uh, th separation between different telescopes, because the, uh, the radio signal arriving from different directions, they would arrive at these two different things at different times. Mm. And that allows you to tell which direction exactly things come from and have that re resolution, okay. which is why it needs to be that big. There is one telescope actually in Antarctica just to make sure we get a whole diameter of Earth in there. And it took them two years to get the uh, data out. Uh, well, there's idiosyncratic reasons. For example, in the winter, Antarctica is closed off, no flights in the north, so it okay. can't take data out. That set them back about half a year. And then later, the um, data analysis, because they're so located at so different, such different locations, the weather patterns are very different, and that noise has to be taken out. And the way of taking out that data has to be bias-free. You can't develop a method, because you have a, an expectation of what it should look like, you develop a method that really optimizes towards that, then you're going to just see what, to ha what you're expecting. And that's not good. So, you, so they have, to avoid that, they have four teams doing very different things, not allowed to talk to each other, okay. only in the end. Um, when they agree, which All is a right. long process. Wow, wow, that's indeed uh, a lot of uh, um, factors that uh, could probably be make it shorter, right, if we are a little bit more um, advanced. Yeah. yeah, but uh, what is the Chinese factor here? I understand there was a Chinese press conference as well, and there was uh, some Chinese uh, participants, officials and scientists talking about China's input. What is China's role here? Well, so more organized role is uh, the National Astron Astronomy uh, Observatory uh, of China um, through the East Asia Observatory operates one of the telescopes in Hawaii, incidentally, mm. uh, that, that contributed. Um, and then individually, uh, researchers from like a lot of different institutions were involved in data analysis efforts. Okay. You started by talking, by saying uh, there is a bit politics there, maybe more than we imagine. What is the politics? No, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not privy to the, uh, to the internal workings, but as you can imagine, 
um, the you know, international the cooperation. Large collaborations. Yeah. There's always. Okay. Uh, how do? How would you? How would you describe? What do you know about the kind of coordination necessary to have this global project and to come out successfully with a picture? Well, you need you need first of all researchers. You need uh, people that are interested in it, and uh, and then you need people across continents that know each other and know how to work together. Mm -hmm. So that's where you start, and that's the first step. Then you need a backing from different uh, governments all over the world that wants to support something like this. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe there's some politics there, uh, but I think the scientists don't care about that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. They they know that there's no point in that. And uh, what you need you need to be able to have some common vision and you need to be able to have contact and be able to work together. And that's what they're doing, I think. And I, I think, of course, there's always, uh, when it comes to technology and, and, and other things, there's always some kind of race and competition. Yeah. yeah. Do you think that's going to affect the kind of cooperation we're going to have? I mean, this race have been you know, in the news for a while, that some people sending people to the moon. OK, let's send me people to the moon, too, as fast as possible, and then to the Mars. Do you think that's going to affect collaboration? I don't think so. You don't think so? No, I don't think so. I think, uh, actually, I, I think historically, uh, some healthy competition has actually been an excellent motivator mm. for, for, uh, for, for development. Provided that it's a healthy, uh, uh, healthy competition. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. All right. And that's where we are, I think. Mm. Yeah. That's where you are. OK. M Professor Zhang, what do you think? Yeah, I, I think healthy competition is good because by, by healthy, I, th I think that means you want to win by going faster than others, not to drag down the others to delay them. Mm -hmm. Then it's good competition, right? Okay. So, yeah. um, what does this picture, what does this picture mean for our understanding of the universe? Uh, I think that is really a fascinating question. Now that we know that the black hole really looks like this, although in theory Einstein has already you know, calculated and, and, and did all of that. What does that mean? What comes next? Uh, so what they're working on right now is analyzing the polarization data. Uh, I won't go into details, but that will tell you the magnetic field around the black holes. That particular black hole is actually launching extremely powerful jets into the universe very far away. Mm -hmm. And those jets uh, help determine the structure of the galaxy clusters how, uh, determine how stars form and all that very important things. But we don't fully understand how that works. There are competing theories and to understand which one really works or none of them do, mm -hmm. we really need that data. So that's what they're working on right okay. now. Okay, so what will be the next? That'll be a big news. Uh, that'll probably be a what more science yeah? community. Yeah, what will people yeah. trying to peak when next? What do you think? Oh, do you do, do, are they already working on something oh, They're already working on that one. And then they're also trying to produce more clear pictures by shifting to higher frequencies. So there's going to be a clear picture. All right. Yeah. When, about, do we know? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> well, <laughs> this one's so. already taken two years. So okay. Uh, yeah. let's, let's wait and see. Well, yeah. it can come as a big band. Surprise, surprise. Who knows? Mm -hmm. Anyway, thank you so much, Professor Zhang Fan from the Beijing Normal University, a professor of astronomy, and uh, Hao Dor Berg, a country representative of Euraxis China, an organization boosting EU China and international collaboration. And with that, we come to the, I hope I passed for that discussion. Oh, that's good. <laughs> with that, we come to the end of this edition of The, of the Point with Neely Sheen. Uh, I'll see you next Monday at the same time. Have a quick weekend. Mm -hmm.